leave no room for hesitation, and I accordingly obeyed forthwith what I still considered a very singular summons. Over okay, so we'll pause for a moment at level one. Very simple. We'll do this all the way through our reading. Let's write it down at level one. Very simple. He says, I showed up at the house of Usher, this mansion, this freaky looking mansion. Number two, he said, I was there because Roderick Usher, my boyhood friend, who I had not seen for a long time, wrote to me and he seemed really distraught, upset. So much so that I felt like I had to go and visit him. So here I am, ready to visit Usher. Let's keep going. Though as boys we had been even intimate associates, yet I really knew little of my friend. His reserve had been always excessive and habitual. I was aware, however, that his very ancient family had been noted time out Top of page 296. For peculiar sensibility of temperament displaying itself through long ages in many works of exalted art, and manifested of late in repeated deeds of munificent yet unobtrusive charity, as well as in a passionate devotion to the intricacies, perhaps even more than to the orthodox and easily recognizable beauties, of musical science. I had learned, too, the very remarkable fact that the stem of the Usher race, all time-honored as it was, had put forth at no period any enduring branch. In other words, that the entire family lay in the direct line of descent, and had always, with very trifling and very temporary variations, so lain. It was this deficiency I considered while running over in thought the perfect keeping of the character of the premises with the accredited character of the people, and while speculating upon the possible influence which the one in the long lapse of centuries might have exercised upon the other, it was this deficiency, perhaps of collateral issue, and the consequent undeviating transmission from sire to son of the patrimony with the name, which had at length so identified the two as to merge the original title of the estate in the quaint and equivocal appellation of the House of Usher an appellation which seemed to include in the minds of the peasantry who used it, both the family and the family mansion. In other words, house means two things. The family mansion, but also the family usher, which has no other descendants. The only remaining ushers live in this house. Okay? which is going to set up, obviously, all kinds of interesting implications to the title, The Fall of the House of Usher. The other thing we should point out at the top of 296 is that these ushers are really into music and musical science, okay? So they're very temperamental artist types. They're very emotional types. All right, I'm with you on 296. I have said that the whole, that the soul effect, there it is. Again, I challenge you, try to not just listen to this reading. You were doing that in kindergarten when the teacher read to you. Really try to read this language. It will teach you better about the story if you're actually reading the words along. So go ahead and do it. Try with your pencil it. See how far you can, you can do it before you're distracted away, all right? Give it a try. I have said that the sole effect of my somewhat childish experiment, that of looking down within the tarn, had been to deepen the first singular impression. There can be no doubt that the consciousness of the rapid increase of my superstition, or why should I not so term it, served mainly to accelerate the increase itself. Such, I have long known, is the paradoxical law of all sentiments having terror as a basis. And it might have been for this reason only that, when I again uplifted my eyes to the house itself from its image in the pool, there grew in my mind a strange fancy, a fancy so ridiculous indeed that I would mention it to show the vivid force of the sensations which oppressed me. I had so worked upon my imagination as really to believe that about the whole mansion and domain there hung an atmosphere peculiar to themselves and their immediate vicinity, an atmosphere which had no affinity with the air of heaven, 
but which had reeked up from the decayed trees and the gray wall and the silent tarn, a pestilent and mystic vapor, dull, sluggish, faintly discernible, and leaden-hued. Okay, if you've ever seen a scary movie where the location is going to matter and the credits of the movie open, but nothing is said, but there's this kind of strange music sometimes, and the camera will just start to pan over the house and begin to kind of show you parts of the house. They are following the blueprint of Poe, who is going to tell you, I ended up in the middle of the scary woods next to this disgusting tarn or river or a lake, pop pond of water. And then all of a sudden my eyes went up to the building and I could have sworn that there was something wrong with this house. Something wasn't right. The atmosphere of the house was like something was wrong. It was almost like a vapor or something was coming off of the house, like something was definitely wrong. Of course, again, creating that mood, right, of kind of scary, freaky. Shaking off from my spirit what must have been a dream, I scanned more narrowly the real aspect of the building. Its principal features seemed to be that of an excessive antiquity. Now to the building the itself. The of ages had been great. Minute fungi overspread the whole exterior, hanging in a fine tangled webwork from the eaves. Yet all this was apart from any extraordinary dilapidation. No portion of the masonry had fallen, and there appeared to be a wild inconsistency between its Top of page 297. parts and the crumbling condition of the individual stones. In this there was much that reminded me of the specious totality of old woodwork, which has rotted for long years in some neglected vault, with no disturbance from the breath of the external air. Beyond this indication of extensive decay, however, the fabric gave little token of instability. Perhaps the eye of a scrutinizing observer might have discovered a barely perceptible fissure which, extending from the roof of the building in front, made its way down the wall in a zigzag direction until it became lost in the sullen waters of the tarn. Okay, so he says, now I looked at the building, the mansion. It had moss, fungi growing all over it, decayed, old. But he said, the building looked pretty solid with the exception of a little crack that ran right from the top of the building all the way down through the center of the building and ended right next to the water where, of course, the building is built right next to this tarn or this pond. All right? Okay, here we go. Keep going. Noticing these things, I rode over a short causeway to the house. A servant in waiting took my horse, and I entered the gothic archway of the hall. First use of a that word, right? Of stealthy step then conducted me in silence through many dark and intricate passages in my progress to the studio of his master. Much that I encountered on the way contributed, I know not how, to heighten the vague sentiments of which I have already spoken. Well, the objects around... And like I said, if you've seen any scary movies and you are familiar with the way it's set up so that there's some individual who comes to the house, knocks on the door, rings the door of the hover, and then the door opens and there's some guy standing behind it, but he's not the guy that actually is the big shot of the house. He's a servant of some kind who will then welcome this person in, walk this person through the house to a room, but never say anything, all blueprints right off this story. Do you got me? In other words, the scary walk into the mansion. It's almost like if it's freaky on the outside, it gets more freaky on the inside. And Poe's going to now describe in detail the inside of this mansion. Everything is about the details. We would call this very rich descriptions at 2B very rich. I said dense. That means all the words are stacked on top of each other, but it's very rich. Notice he's going to elicit all five of the senses. What he can see, what he can touch, what he can smell, etc. Right? Here we go. Found me while the carvings of the ceilings, the somber tapestries of the walls, the ebon blackness of the floors, 
and the phantasmagoric armorial trophies which rattled as I strode were but matters to which, or to such as which, I had been accustomed from my infancy. While I hesitated not to acknowledge how familiar was all this, I still wondered to find how unfamiliar were the fancies which ordinary images were stirring up. On one of the staircases, I met the physician of the family. His countenance, I thought, wore a mingled expression of low cunning and perplexity. He accosted me with trepidation and passed on. The valet now threw open a door and ushered me into the presence of his master. Now before we get there, one other observation. On his way up the stairs and into the room where he's being led by the valet or the servant, the family physician or doctor comes out, gives him a look, doesn't say anything, and then walks past him. Already in your notes at level one, you can infer somebody is sick in the house of Usher. Right? Somebody is sick in the house of Usher. Something is wrong. All of this, man, we've read two and a half pages. All of this could be reduced to one line at level one. He shows up at the mansion, walks in the front door, and goes towards the room where he's going to meet his pal, his old pal, Usher. Right? But notice all of this language Poe is going to use to describe in detail who he's going to meet. Let's now, in our notes, at level one, write down the name Roderick Usher, and we're going to have some descriptions of Usher. We're going to begin with physical descriptions. What does he look like? Okay? Welcome to Roderick Usher. Again, all of it is designed to be kind of freaky, all right? The room in which I found myself was very large and lofty. The windows were long, narrow, and pointed, and at so vast a distance from the black oaken floor as to be altogether inaccessible from within. Feeble gleams of encrimsoned light made their way through the trellised panes and served to render sufficiently distinct the more prominent objects around. The eye, however, struggled in vain to reach the remoter angles of the chamber or the recesses of the vaulted and fretted ceiling. Dark draperies hung upon the walls. The general furniture was profuse, comfortless, antique, and tattered. Many books and musical instruments lay scattered about, but failed to give any vitality to the scene. I felt that I breathed an atmosphere of sorrow. An air of stern, deep, and irredeemable gloom hung over and pervaded all. Upon my entrance, Usher arose from a sofa on which he had been lying at full length and greeted me with a vivacious warmth which had much in it, I at first... Top of page 298. The ...overdone cordiality of the constrained effort of the ennuyé man of the world. A glance, however, at his countenance convinced me of his perfect sincerity. We sat down, and for some moments, while he spoke not, I gazed upon him with a feeling half of pity, half of awe. Surely, man had never before so terribly altered in so brief a period as had Roderick Usher. Okay, so here we go. He's going to say, finally I get into the room, and when I walk in this room, it is a strange feeling. Dark musty smelling, laying on the couch is Usher, and as I come in, he jumps up and he says, I'm really glad you're here, but something is wrong with Usher. And now our narrator is going to say, he doesn't look right. There's something wrong with the way he looks. Now I'm with you on page 298. Let's really work now uh, to try, it was with difficulty that I could bring myself to admit the identity. It's like, dude, he's changed. He doesn't look the way he used to. The obvious question for the reader will be, what is wrong with Roderick Usher? Here we go. It was with difficulty that I could bring myself to admit the identity of the one being before me with a companion of my early boyhood. Yet the character of his face had been at all times remarkable. A cadaverousness of complexion an eye large, liquid, and luminous beyond comparison, lips somewhat thin and very pallid, but of a surpassingly beautiful curve, 
a nose of a delicate Hebrew model, but with a breadth of nostril unusual in similar formations. A finely molded chin, speaking in its want of prominence, of a want of moral energy. Hair of a more than web-like softness and tenuity. These features, with an inordinate expansion above the regions of the temple, made up altogether a countenance not easily to be forgotten. And now, in the mere exaggeration of the prevailing character of these features, and of the expression they were wont to convey, lay so much of change that I doubted to whom I spoke. The now ghastly pallor of the skin, and the now miraculous luster of the eye, above all things startled and even awed me. The silken hair, too, had been suffered to grow all unheeded, and as in its wild gossamer texture it floated rather than fell about the face, I could not even with effort connect its arabesque expression with any idea of simple humanity. In the now let's pause for a moment and just point out, passages like the one that you just read, really important for novelists to come who would follow Pope. Notice he takes several hundred words to describe Usher's face. And if you want for a second in your annotations at level one, you can go back and look. He describes the eyes. He describes the nose. He describes the lips. He describes the chin. He describes the hair. And if you've ever read a novel where detailed descriptions of the character's face are going to set up something about the character very much following Poe. Poe very much wants you to get a picture of this person's face as being, for your notes, unusual. The face is an unusual face, which is going to be compelling to our narrator. All right, let's keep going. The manner of my friend, I was at once struck with an incoherence, an inconsistency, and I soon found this to arise from a series of feeble and futile struggles to overcome an habitual trepidancy an excessive nervous agitation. For something of this nature I had indeed been prepared, no less by his letter than by reminiscences of certain boyish traits, and by conclusions deduced from his peculiar physical conformation and temperament. He's kind of a nervous guy. His action was alternately vivacious and sullen. His voice varied rapidly from a tremulous indecision, when the animal spirit seemed utterly in abeyance, to that species of energetic concision, that abrupt, weighty, unhurried, and hollow-sounding enunciation, that leaden, self-balanced, and perfectly modulated guttural utterance, which may be observed in the lost drunkard, or the irreclaimable eater of opium, during the periods of his most intense excitement. Top of page 299. It was thus that he spoke of the object of my visit, of his earnest desire to see me, and of the solace he expected me to afford him. He entered at some length into what he conceived to be the nature of his malady. It was, he said, a constitutional and a family evil, and one for which he despaired to find a remedy, a mere nervous affection, he immediately added, which would undoubtedly soon pass off. It displayed itself in a host of unnatural sensations. Some of these, as he detailed them, interested and bewildered me, although perhaps the terms and the general manner of their narration had their weight. He suffered much from a morbid acuteness of the senses. The most insipid food was alone endurable. He could wear only garments of certain texture. The odors of all flowers were oppressive. His eyes were tortured by even a faint light. And there were but peculiar sounds, and these from stringed instruments, which did not inspire him with horror. So... From the face description, we now are told that Usher will confide to the narrator, something is wrong with me. The word is malady. Something is wrong with me. I'm very agitated and nervous all the time, he says to him. I don't like light. That's why the curtains are all drawn. It's totally dark in the room. I don't like most food. Things bug me. I can easily be upset with the exception of certain kinds of musical sounds. Already, obviously, the reader is going, what is wrong with this guy? It's 
keep going. To an anomalous species of terror, I found him a bounden slave. I shall perish, said he. I must perish in this deplorable folly. He says he's going to die. And not otherwise shall I be lost. I dread the events of the future, not in themselves, but in their results. I shudder at the thought of any, even the most trivial incident, which may operate upon this intolerable agitation of soul. I have indeed no abhorrence of danger, except in its absolute effect, in terror. In this unnerved, in this pitiable condition, I feel that the period will sooner or later arrive when I must abandon life and reason together in some struggle with the grim phantasm fear. Whoa, so go ahead and put it in your notes really quickly. Right away, the first time we hear Usher talk, what is wrong with this cat? What would you say he's most disturbed by? What does he say he's most disturbed by? He's afraid of the future. He has an overwhelming sense of fear about the future and what will happen at some point in the future. So much so that it is driving him insane. Driving him nuts. He has tremendous fear of the future. Okay? And he doesn't know what to do about it. Alright, let's keep reading now and see how this one unfolds for us. I learned moreover at intervals and through broken and equivocal hints another singular feature of his mental condition. He was enchained by certain superstitious impressions in regard to the dwelling which he tenanted, and whence for many years he had never ventured forth. He doesn't leave the house. Influence whose supposititious force was conveyed in terms too shadowy here to be restated, an influence which some peculiarities in the mere form and substance of his family mansion.